videos worked well for you. Um, masters of the theory, we are going to do a little bit of the practice. Um, and as you know, in this class, we're really trying to <clears throat> bring the theory into the real world. So how do we design a schema in the real world? So as a comparison, we're going to do SQL versus MongoDB for a blog. So here is an example schema that you might use for a blog using MySQL or SQLite or whatever, um, where you have your posts here on the left, uh, and then you have to somehow link all the comments on that post. So I have a post comments table there. Uh, and then obviously if you have a multi-author blog, you know, like a news site or something like that, uh, then you're going to have multiple authors. So you're going to have to use author ID and link that to the posts. Um, you know, if you have multi-author, multi-subject blog, you're going to have different tags. Uh, so you might have, I don't know, a sports blog with cycling and swimming and, you know, other types of things. So you need to tag your posts with, um, you know, those, those categories. So lots of different tables here uh, that you need to join together to um, create your blog. But in MongoDB, there aren't really any joins. Um, you know, there's no pre-declared schema. Uh, so what that means is there's, there's nothing to really enforce uh, how your blog is set up in terms of the tables, right? You don't need to have specific columns as we talked about previously. There's no foreign key constraints. So, uh, you know, in, in the previous example, Right, you might have authors uh, be a foreign key constraint on posts, right? You can't have an invalid author ID. Uh, there's no joins, uh, mostly, uh, but the power of MongoDB is that we can embed data inside other data, right? So you can put uh, your relevant data all together. Um, and so even though you can't really have atomic operations across different documents or different collections, like you can in MySQL, uh, you can still, um, be smart about it and embed the data that you need inside other data. So for example, if you know, you need to, for some reason, enforce that the comments and the posts, you know, need to be updated together in an atomic way. You can still embed the comments inside the posts. You don't have to have joins. You don't have to have any of this linking going on. You just put the comments directly inside the posts and then it's automatically an atomic transaction. Um, and then we can still reference other documents by their ID. So we'll see that example um, shortly. So the thing about MongoDB and the, and the power of MongoDB, right? Well, let me phrase it this way. The emphasis of MongoDB is to design your document, design your schema according to how you're going to use the data. Right, so in SQL, you are tr really trying hard to design your schema application agnostic. So it doesn't matter what application is using your data, it's set up in a very logical way where any application can access that data in a way that, that, is, that is agnostic. It's not set up for any particular application, it is set up for, for consistency and for, for, you know, so that the, the design matches the idea of the data itself. In MongoDB, we do the opposite. Instead of trying to be application agnostic, we try to be application specific. We design our database specifically according to how we want to use the data most of the time. 
So this is what a blog post might look like in MongoDB, right? So we have this posts collection, right? Here is our entire document. I mean, in reality, it'd be a little more, you know, bigger than this. But for example, we would have a title, the body, blah, blah, blah. This is the content, the author ID. Notice there is an ID here, but we'll get to that in a minute. The date is whatever. And then the comments. I have embedded inside this post. Why have I embedded the comments inside this post? Because they only apply to this post, right? I don't need another collection of comments because these particular comments that are right here are only applicable to this post right here. So as long as I don't exceed the maximum document size. I can put as many comments related to this post as I want, and it will always be connected because that's the way I'm going to use it, right? I'm never just going to look up this comment by itself. It doesn't make sense in my application. The only way this comment makes sense is if it's commenting on this particular post. So in my application, I'm going to use all of this data together, so I should put it all together in my database. That is, that is what the, the idea of MongoDB is. Put the data together that you're going to use together. And then down here, I might have another collection for authors. And why do I do that for authors as opposed to comments? And the reason is because I have one author that is probably associated with multiple posts, right? So I only have one, I only have one comment here that is, or several comments, but they're associated with one particular post. But my authors down at the bottom might be associated with multiple posts. And I'm also gonna use that author data in multiple different ways, right? When the author logs in they want to see their profile. I'm going to use that author information independently of the posts. If somebody wants to look up an author and see what posts they have associated with them, right? They're going to look up the author first independently, and then we're going to search through the posts to find them, right? So comments and authors are different in this case, and we have to set up our document differently depending on how we're going to use the data. So in MySQL or in SQL, right, relational databases, generally what we do is we set up third normal form in order to be application agnostic. We want to set up the data so that any application can use it, any developer can understand it. But with no SQL, before you even start designing your database, you have to ask yourself several questions. What data are we using together in our app? What data are we reading most often? And what data are we inserting and updating most often? So these are the critical questions before you start designing your schema, right? It's use driven. How am I going to use my data? Not what does the data look like? What is the idea of the data? It's how am I going to use it? So the characteristics of a typical MongoDB schema, you have rich documents, so nesting and embedding. So that's exactly what we were just talking about with our uh, blog post. You pre-join the data. So instead of having multiple different tables that you then have to join together, you have it pre-joined. It's all, not all, but almost all the way you're going to use it most often, right? There is not going to be one perfect way to do it for all cases, and there isn't an SQL either. But what you can do is pre-join the data based on what you think you're going to use more, most often. And you can always change it. Right? You can always go back and change the schema of a MongoDB database because there is no you know, enforced structure. So yes, it would be a pain,
but it's not as bad as SQL. If you need to go back and take out embedding or decide that you want to embed something, you can do that in MongoDB much more flexibly than you can in SQL. So generally speaking, we don't use joins in MongoDB. What you do is you do it in the app, right? So uh, if you have two collections that you're, that you're essentially trying to join, uh, what you do is you, you get the data you want from both collections and then you use your app to show what you want. And the reason that you do that is because it's faster, right? Remember the database is set up for reading quickly the data you need. And then in your app, you can always filter really easily if you do it in a smart way. Um, and like I said, this is important for scaling and performance because you want your data to be used or your data to be set up the way you're going to use it. So that when you scale it, when you have millions or billions of entries in your database, you're not constantly having to try to join things uh, like you do in SQL. Mongo. Because of the way that MongoDB scales with sharding, and we'll get to that on Thursday, um, you, you really, you can't join across collections um, when, when you have many, many servers. It just doesn't, it doesn't work. It doesn't scale in MongoDB. So it's important to embed the data you need together if you're going to use it frequently. Um, and again, there's no foreign keys, no, no constraints on your data. Um, this seems like a big deal right now, but um, because of embedding, uh, you know, you, you don't really need it in MongoDB. Uh, you're going to connect the data inside a single document um, that you need. So in, in the blog example where you have to have certain, you know, post IDs in your comments, uh, otherwise the, the data base kind of falls apart, you don't need that in MongoDB because your comments are already inside your post. So if you delete the post, the comments are deleted as well. They're not sort of left hanging there with no, with no post ID. Again, atomic operations. Uh, if you have everything in the same document, it's automatically atomic. Uh, you don't need to worry about different parts, different tables of your database being updated uh, in a single transaction because you're doing a single transaction on a single document. Um, and that is guaranteed atomic in MongoDB. And no pre-declared schema, right? This is actually a strength of MongoDB in, in many situations. Yeah, uh, it's nice in SQL to have some structure and enforce uh, a schema, uh, especially when you have multiple developers working on the same database. Um, in MongoDB, right, we, we take a slightly different, different approach where uh, especially if you're using different versions of an app on the same database, or if you know you want to add comments at a later time, or say some blog posts don't have any comments and some do, uh, you know that is a nice feature of MongoDB. Is is the database is flexible in that way where you can structure it again the way you're going to use it, not the way the data demands that you structure it. Um, but obviously, you need a well-designed schema. That doesn't mean just create everything on the fly, right? That's that's a horrible idea. Uh, as you learned last week, there are trade-offs in every design, and you need to think about those when you're designing your schema. So um, it is important to have a well-designed schema, but also a flexible one that is not, you know, rigid and pre-declared, because as you move forward, it might uh, you might need to change it or add things, and that becomes a lot easier in MongoDB if you have a well-designed schema. So, generally speaking, um, you know these are the goals of normalization, uh, and we obviously spent a lot of time on this in the first half of the semester. But you know we want to free the database of modification anomalies, right? You don't want to have uh, three different professors in your database, Mr. Bartus, Mr. Bartukas, Mr. Barfus, or whatever, uh, because somebody couldn't spell my name, right? 
Uh, you want to have one professor table with all the professors and then a professor ID, right? That saves you from modification anomalies, stuff like that. Um, you want to minimize redesign when extending, right? So say uh, you now have assistant professors, right? Uh, you don't want to have to redesign your entire database just to add assistant professors. Um, and then a big thing of normalization, right, is the whole point is it's a data-driven design, right? You design your database according to each table being one idea so that no application is, is emphasized, right? So that any access pattern of your database makes sense. Uh, the data itself is set up in, in, a, in an intuitive way. Um, and it's not, you know, there, there's no weird anomalies in your database just to make one application work better, right? The whole point is that it's um, application agnostic. But, um, you know, that's, that's kind of the opposite of what we're going to do here in MongoDB. So let's pretend that I'm going to try to make a more SQL-y version of my MongoDB um, blog database. Um, so as you can see here, I kind of made it JSON-ish. It's not actually JSON, obviously. Um, but let's just say I had these collections, these four collections, and I wanted to um, use them for my blog post. Um, I just want to show how this doesn't really work in MongoDB because there, first of all, there are no joints, right? We're not going to be able to join these, these tables in the database and select what we want the same way that we could in SQL. Um, so we really are trying to force a square peg into a round hole by having you know these ID fields, these author ID goes to user, post ID goes to post here ID. Um, you know, there's no real way to know what order the comments are in for the post. So I had to add this order field, or maybe I'd have to add a date field. Um, you know, I'm gonna have to do all the joins in my application, right? I'm gonna basically have to select all of the data out of the database every single time somebody goes to my application just to find the things that I need. Um, so, this kind of setup in MongoDB doesn't make sense. If you need this kind of setup, it's better to use MySQL, right? I don't want you to get the impression that I'm saying MongoDB is better at everything. It is not. It is better at certain things and SQL is better at certain things. And the answer as always in this class is it depends, right? So if you end up with a schema design like this and it just, it kind of feels like it has to be like this, right? It's probably better for SQL, right? An example, like an accounting database, right? That really fits tabular data. It just makes more sense in tabular data. And it makes more sense to use an SQL database if you're just doing accounting. Um, so the point of this is let's not use this kind of schema design for our blog post because it just doesn't make sense. Um, if it looks and smells too much like tabular data, it probably is tabular data and it's probably better in a relational database. So here's a slightly better way, right? So, um, this is from a MongoDB database set up a little bit more MongoDB ish. So you can see that here is um, my blog post, right? Um, the title is actually at the bottom. I keep, the title is actually at the bottom there, which hopefully will go away. Um, and that's because MongoDB doesn't order things in the back and the way the, the way it might be obvious to us, right? Putting the title at the top. But anyway, so you have the author, you have the body, blah blah blah. This is my awesome blog post. This is a test body. You have your title, and then the comments, right, are embedded right in it. And 
the date is stored obviously as a date, um, permalink, if you know about blog posts, and then tags, you know, I just added a whole bunch of tags. Who knows Who knows what, people, what the authors are going to tag their stuff with. But again, those are embedded right inside the post. So when I search for a blog post or when I'm displaying blog posts, all my data is right there. So my real question, right, you know, looking back at the SQL here is, well, what about modification anomalies, right? Like, what if people type in um, different, you know, different author IDs, different tags, stuff like that? Like, wouldn't we be susceptible to that in a way that we're not with SQL, right? So, yes, and I would argue that in this case, because we have separated out the authors, as I mentioned before, because you're gonna access authors independently of your blog posts, right? The way you're going to use the database determined that we're gonna put authors in a different collection. So therefore, we should use the ID field of the author's document instead of trying to have this user ID um, because we can't change that. It's immutable, right? So just like you see the ID up here uh, for this blog post, it's automatically created by MongoDB. The authors will have something very similar. And so um, we should be using that ID, which we can then link to in our application really easily um, and connect the authors to their blog posts. What about this, right? Like say somebody's commenting and they put in John at Doe and Jane at Doe and, oh, I typed it in wrong. It's Janie, two E's or something at Doe. Like, do we really care, right? Again, you have to think about how you're using your application, right? Like, yeah, we could enforce some kind of email, you know, thing here, but it's a blog post comment. Who cares, right? I don't really care whether their email is typed in correctly, right? Um, it just doesn't bother me in my in my application design. So um, it is much easier for me to embed my comments here and leave the email as they typed it in rather than try and enforce that. Um, obviously that might be different in different applications, but as far as update anomalies go and enforcing it, I really don't care in this case. And then for the tags, you know, what if I really want to enforce cycling and bicycling and biking as being the same thing? Yeah, maybe, you know, um, I could enforce that in my app probably pretty easily by having, you know, the authors only be able to check certain boxes for tags or, um, you know, presenting them with a list of options uh, and a create new or something like that. Like, there just aren't that many tags. I'm not really worried about some of my blog posts being under cycling and biking. I mean, this is me, right? This is my opinion right now about the tags. If it's really important to you to, to enforce this, then there, you know, you can do that. Um, you could even create a different collection with tags and have tag ID if you wanted to enforce that in your app very rigidly, right? The same way we're doing authors here. Um, but, you know, in this particular case for blogs, tags, eh, I don't really care that much. And honestly, once in a blue moon, I can always come back through my database and just say, oh, look, I have cycling and biking tags. Why don't I just update all of my biking tags to say cycling? And, and I'm done, right? Like it's not something I need to do every day or every second or hundreds of times every second. It's just not something I'm, I'm worried about performance wise. It's just something that I'm looking through my, app, my application and I say, oh, it would be nice if cycling and biking were the same tag. And so I just update it. I, I do it once. So again, it really just depends on how you are using your data and what your application is doing. Um, so, you know, what if somebody deletes a post in here, right? This becomes really complicated in, in this kind of design. 
um, where my post ID is kind of left hanging because there's no foreign key constraints, right? Um, so really in MongoDB, if I just delete the post, it's going to delete everything associated with it anyway. So there's really no issue there. Um, and one quick, you know, related performance question is why is MongoDB so fast on big data? This was a bigger deal when we had these these platter hard drives, um, but it it was noticeably faster. And the reason is when you're using SQL, right, and you have to join all these tables, which we might be all over your disks, right? It's really slow in terms of selection speed, right, for this physical arm to go back and forth and select your data. Whereas in MongoDB, you've designed it so that all the data you're interested in is together. And so that used to make a huge difference, not so much anymore, because, you know, we have flash drives are, are much more common, especially in servers, and, and we, you know, have huge memory and stuff like that. But it's still something to think about, right? It's our data that we're looking for is all together in one place. So um, just an interesting performance, actual like related to the physical application of hard drives. Um, you know, the way you design a database actually has physical implications for the hardware you're using. That's just a, a an interesting um, side note. So how do we deal with ACID? Uh, since there are no concepts of a transaction in MongoDB, um, we have atomicity, atomicity within a single document, right? Um, you can't rely on two separate documents being in a single transaction in MongoDB. Um, you can only rely on... Um, a transaction within a single document being guaranteed atomic. So you have basically three approaches. Restructure it, right? So if you need this, then you need to put, you need to embed all the data that has to be uh, atomically accessed or updated inside a single document schema, right? Um, you can manage this in your app. Right, so if you like your schema, you want to keep it that way. Um, you can force your app to deal with the atomicity, right? Um, which is a little more kludgy, but you know, let let me put it this way: in a bank, right, you're gonna care a lot whether your operations are atomic, right, and consistent um, and durable. The you know withdrawal of a hundred bucks from Bobby's account and deposit into Susie's account, it matters that it happens as a single transaction. For your blog post, who cares, right? Like, I don't care if, you know, Bobby looks at his Facebook page and sees whether I've commented at the same time that Susie sees my comment. I just don't care at all. So, that is not something I need to worry about in terms of my specific application. So, um, again, it depends on how you're using it. So, right, you have to just deal with it. In Facebook, Twitter, blog posts, whatever, you, you, you think about what you need to have atomic, and for the rest, you just don't care, right? Yeah, it'd be nice if it if if the comments showed up at perfectly the same time. If you know one person comments before another, that their comment always shows up before mine. But if it does sometimes and doesn't other times, I just don't care. Like I just don't. If if it helps my performance and my and my application uh, work well to not have that perfect consistency about my comments or my tags, then who cares, right? Um, you focus on the things that are most important to your application. But of course there are ex exceptions, right? Um, so you have employee and you have resume, right? Things to think about in this case, right? You might look at this and right away say, oh, well, obviously you should embed the resume inside the employee because I'm only gonna ever access the resume 
along with the employee data. But are you? And do you need to access the resume every time you access the employee? Or are you just going to access the resume like when they're hired and then, you know, maybe again, maybe not even when they're fired, right? You're probably not going to access the resume very often, right? So do you really need to embed it inside the employee document? Probably not, right? What if they have, what if you have a video of their interview process, right? Or a recording or something and, it, and it's really, really big, right? It's, it's hundreds of megabytes. Do you really want to embed that in your employee document so that every time you are accessing your employees for payroll and everything, it has to load a hundred megabytes of video? Probably not, right? So you have to think about how you're going to be using your data more often. And then again, atomicity. Like we don't, we don't really care. There's not a lot of, of related data in here that needs to be connected. Um, we just we just don't care if we you know probably the only thing I can think of is employee ID that needs to be atomic here right if we update their employee ID we don't want non-existent or incorrect employee IDs to be floating around but how often are you going to update someone's employee ID like hopefully never right so I would argue that even though it kind of makes sense to put someone's resume inside their employee document. I wouldn't, I just, I would leave it as its own collection because you're never, you're almost never going to use it, right? And you don't want to be loading it every time you load the employee because you're going to use the employee a lot. Um, so those are the kinds of things you need to think about in terms of what are your priorities, right? So here are some examples of one to many, right? blog post and comments, right? We kind of decided that comments should be in a blog post. But what about city and person, right? Do I really want to have a city document with all the information about a city and then try to embed all the people <laughs> that live in that city? I mean, maybe that would work for like, I don't know, let's small town with 10 people in it, but it's certainly not going to work for New York, right? Um, so I got to I gotta decide, first of all, how many things I'm embedding and what the size of those things I'm embedding are. So what about the other way around, right? What if I have my collection of people and I try to embed the city information in each person? Well, that's just way too much redundant information, right? Like I'm going to be copying the information about New York 10 million times. Like that that's ridiculous. I don't want to do that, right? So one to many can get pretty tricky depending on how many you have, how you're going to use the data, right? As always, it depends. And then of course you have many to many, right? Books and authors teachers and students, right? You really need to think about how you're going to use the data, not about how the data is structured, right? So the way SQL is thought of, right? You would have different tables. You would link them. You would join them. In MongoDB, remember, it's not, don't think data-centric, think application-centric. How are you actually going to use it? Is it a library? Is it a bookstore? Is it... Um, you know, a university database? Is it just a, you know, a mailing list? You know, it really depends on how you're going to use the data. You know, you can still denormalize if that's what you need for your, for performance, right? If, if you need to embed authors in all the books and have redundant data, that's what you need to do. But you have to be able to explain it. You have to be able to say, this is why I'm doing that. Because of performance, because of atomicity, because of Whatever your reason is, um, you know, you have to document that and put that in your design. So uh, just to kind of sum up here again, there's no pre-declared schema, right? We're not going to enforce uh, a schema like we do in SQL. No foreign key constraints, and we're not going to have 
joins inside our database. But we can embed data inside other data, so kind of join it that way. We can have atomic operations if we're smart about embedding by putting it inside, so the comments inside the blog post. And we can still reference other documents by their ID if we need to. Um, so we can do the things we need to do, but you have to have a good reason for it. That is all. That is that is MongoDB in a nutshell. You have to have a reason for it. You can't just design it like SQL based on the data you have. You have to design it based on how you're going to use the data. So your homework for this week is to create an application-driven design. Uh, I want you to create a MongoDB schema for an online store. Right? You can have whatever kind of store you want, but basically uh, you need products, right? And you need detailed information. And this is, you know, this is the minimum. Don't just use the words I have on this page to create the minimum possible, right? I really want you to think about creating a real application for like an online store. And I want you to have sizes, types, colors, et cetera, et cetera, means add more things, right? Think about what, a real application would need and implement it. I want you to have customers, right? That might be more than one collection. I don't know, right? I want you to explain your design decisions, right? So it's not just going to be the schema. You're going to have to include an explanation as well. So there's going to be products, there's going to be customers, and there's going to be sales. And that's the minimum that you're going to need for this, for this assignment. Um, and then you're going to need to explain your decisions uh, in like paragraphs, paragraph form as well. Uh, this is just optional. So uh, you, you can't have huge uh, collections, right? You can't have things like videos inside your collections because it gets too big too quickly. So there's other ways around it. This is just optional. If you want to view it, you can. Um, but your homework for this week is uh, to build a online store schema. If you have any questions, please hit me up on Discord or email, and I will be back on Thursday.